at the time of my life. It's Wave 105. It's the big drive home on the day that I also wished my football club was owned by someone that baked cakes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> See? Everyone mocks her for going on the pitch. A little bit sozzled. Being a Norwich fan. There we are. are. She's, yes. she's doing us all right. Do you want to buy another club? Going cheap. Uh, no. Okay. Thank you. One's enough. Um, now, I didn't realise just how many connections there are between the Beatles and Bournemouth. Uh, Nick Churchill from Beer Regis has just published a new book called Yeah, 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 The Beatles and Bournemouth. And he's talking about the many connections. Uh, he's also got about 200 uh, rare and previously unpublished photos. Now, Nick spoke to our reporter, Charlotte Butts, about the connections the Fab Four had to the team. Firstly, they played... More shows at the Bournemouth Gaumont, which is now the, o- the Odeon on uh, Westover Road, than any other UK theatre outside of London, mainly due to the fact that they started in August 1963 with a six-day summer season. Whilst they were there that, that week, they stayed at the Palace Court Hotel, uh, and in the dining room there, a photographer called Robert Freeman took the, photo- the famous half-shadow photographs that became the cover shot of With the Beatles, their second album. So it was the first really iconic Beatles photo session. When they came back to Bournemouth in November 63 to play the Winter Gardens, the Daily Mirror had coined the term Beatlemania about a fortnight before. The three American TV networks, ABC, CBS and NBC, had all sent camera crews to the Winter Gardens in Bournemouth to film the Beatles. And all three of them wanted to be the first to show this great new British beat phenomenon on American television. The original footage went out on the 22nd of November which was the day that JFK was assassinated, then got buried for several weeks uh, and then was, was rebroadcast again on the, on the 10th of December. But it, set in, it set in motion the ball that actually sort of brought Beatlemania to America. So by the time they landed in New York in February 64 to do the Ed Sullivan show, which many people think was the first time they appeared on television in the States, they were already at number one. But up until that point, America hadn't really been interested in the Beatles. And it was all thanks to a Bournemouth gig. Later, of course, John Lennon bought uh, a bungalow at Sandbanks for his Aunt Mimi. Now, Aunt Mimi had brought John up from the age of five because his, his mother was, uh, was estranged and his father had, had run away. So uh, Mimi had lived in, in Liverpool, just around the corner from Penny Lane. And as soon as the Beatles became famous, she and the other parents were... Well, she and the Beatles' parents were sort of besieged by fans. So the story was that John came home and found her sort of crying on the stairs one day because of all the fans that were in the garden and the rest of it, and um, brought her down to where he was living in Weybridge, and she decided she wanted to live by the sea, so he, he took her shopping for a house, and uh, they bought a bungalow on the water's edge at Sandbanks. Cool, there's not many better places to be, is there really? Well, lovely, an amazing place. Lovely I setting. think that was before it was the sort of... Uh, Platinum Peninsula or whatever they call it now. <laughs> but uh, she lived there from 65 until she died in 1991. Uh, John used to come down quite a lot. Um, he called it one of the loveliest places I know in the world. And he'd, he'd be down here with, uh, with Cynthia, his wife, um, and baby son Julian. They'd play on the beach. There's a, there's a wonderful photograph in the book of, of John, Julian, and Mimi by the Sandbanks Ferry. And John's got the Afghan coat from the Sergeant Pepper session era and holding a bucket and spade and got Julian in his hand. A terrific photograph. Yeah, well, that's Nick Churchill, wow. the author of a new book, Yeah, 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 The Beatles and Bournemouth. If you want to see some of those photos, um, there is an exhibition at Bournemouth Central Library uh, on until the new year. And, uh, and yeah, so that's, there we are. More connections than you'd have thought between Bournemouth and the absolutely Beatles. Absolutely love any Beatles story. It's just absolutely fascinating. Being an Isle of Wight, the Beatles never played the Isle of Wight. They were too big at the time. There was nowhere on the island that could afford to have them. They didn't play any of the festivals as well. Although Paul McCartney was the only Beatle not at the 1969 festival. Right. And Lennon was at the 1970 festival watching Hendrix as well. And apparently, the song Ticket to Ride... Uh, the, uh, the the kind of the popular myth is that uh, in 1960, Lennon and McCartney hitchhiked their way down to Portsmouth, caught the ferry to Ride because McCartney's brother was working in a pub in Ride, and they spent some time with him in Ride. Is that true? I don't know, but that's the popular myth. I love well, I that like story. It. As the myth goes, I like that. Yep, I hope it's true. Me too. Akers, thank you very much. Fascinating stuff. Yeah.